Good morning. Let's stand to our feet as we worship the one true God, spirit and truth, as we sing, Great Are You, Lord.
Amen, church. Amen. Great are you, Lord. Welcome to Living Hope. As we often say, it's a joy to get together. It's a joy to worship the one true God, to sing of his greatness, and to declare truths of him to ourselves as a reminder and to those around us. As we get into this next song, there's a bridge here that we're going to sing. And I just want to take a minute to focus in on this part as we sing my king forever the bridge goes i lift my hands up lay my whole life down my whole life down before you i lift my hands up lay my whole life down my whole life now is for you whole but christ's work on the cross was not 99 percent effective it was a hundred percent effective and it was 100% on him. And so when we look at our lives and we look at the daily grind and the interactions, perhaps whether it's here on a Sunday morning or whether it's with neighbors at home, coworkers, family members, do we recognize that he bought us? We were ransomed. And the price was expensive. It was the life of our Lord. As I was reading through Mark chapter 13 in my studies this week, I came across this section. And just listen, it's, it's not that encouraging to be truthful what Christ says to his disciples. The encouragement comes afterwards. But listen to the expectation as the end draws near, as we walk this life. It is not a promise of ease. He says to his disciples, be on guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand before gen um, governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And Christ says, then the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious before what you are going to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you but the Holy Spirit who speaks. Brother will deliver brother over to death. Father, his children. Children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who perseveres will show the demonstration of their genuine faith. But folks, it is not partial and as times get difficult, and as there is more and more opposition to the gospel message of Jesus Christ, may we be emboldened to stand for him, for the message of the gospel. May it be ever on our lips, and may we lay our lives down, for they do not belong to us, they belong to him. Let's continue to worship.
King of heaven, my King forever. Amen, church. This is one out of retirement for a week. I pray the message of this song from death to life from what looks like a conquered and defeated dead savior to risen in freedom let's close with this final song here sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope, no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to death. When death was arrested, my life began. Your grace so free washes over me. You have made me know that our life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a rat. Be faithfully born. And he canceled my debt and he called me his friend. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace is so free, washes over. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us know that our life begins with you. Oh, yes, it does. A Savior displayed on the criminal's cross. Darkness rejoices the heaven at long. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hell. That's when death was arrested when my life began. That's when death was arrested when my life began. Your grace so free washes over me. You have made me know that our life begins with you. It's your endless love, it's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us know what our life begins with you. Yeah, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the
that you, Lord Jesus, you would come, you would live the perfect life, you would die the death that we so deserved, you would rise victorious, having appeased the wrath of the Father, that we may be forgiven of our sins and spend an eternity with you in glory. Lord, we hasten the day. It's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. Take a minute to say hi to someone. joining us today. Let's take a look at all the ways you can engage with our church in the upcoming weeks. The LH Cares Food Pantry item of the month for August are cereal and full-size snacks. Your generous donations can be dropped off by the LH Cares Food Pantry display in our lobby. Healthy groups are led by healthy leaders. We invite existing small group leaders or anyone who is interested in leading a group to join us on Saturday, August 17th at 9 a.m. for a time together that will fuel your faith and sharpen your leadership as we make disciples here at Living Hope. Let's go out to the ball game. Families from Living Hope and We Care are invited to a summer night of baseball to watch the Trenton Thunder on Sunday, August 18th. Registration includes a hot dog and drink. For more details and to sign up, check out our website. LH Men is hosting a breakfast get-together on August 24th at 8.30 a.m. Come out and enjoy a time of good food and connection with other men. Sign up online. Jared Haas will be hosting a new Sunday morning discipleship class called The Meaning of Marriage. This class is for married and engaged couples who want to grow in their relationship with each other and with God through a study of scripture. We'll seek to better understand biblical principles, context, and God's vision for your marriage. The class will start on September 8th during the 9.30 a.m. service. Make sure to sign up online to let us know you are coming. As always, stop by churchlh.com and our Church Center app to find more info and to sign up for any of these events. Thank you for watching and welcome to Living Hope. Like Emma said, uh, we just want to welcome you here to Living Hope. I'm Brian, one of the pastors here. I've had a chance to meet a couple new people in the halls um, earlier already, and so we're just thankful for you checking out our church. Just uh, As you saw, there's a lot of ways for you to get involved. A special plug for our group leaders workshop. If you're a person that wants to lead a small group or lead one, we'd love to uh, gather with you on the 17th. I'm going to lead some training with Beth Cash, but um, just want to say thanks for being here. Um, if you're new, like I mentioned, we have a new here section would give you a free gift. It's going to look like this. Inside is some information about our church. Also, just a little mug to say uh, thank you, a little logo on our, just to say thank you for being here, a little coffee in there as well. Um, but mostly, we just want to uh, just connect with you, get to know you, and see if there's a way we can help you engage further here with Living Hope. In the seats in front of you, you might see a connection card. If you have any kind of prayer request, if you want to say you want to get baptized, you just want more information about our church, maybe you're impacted about our services today and you've come to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we'd love to know. So fill that out. You can drop that in the office. Offering uh, envelopes in the boxes in the back of the building or the back of these rooms. If you don't see something in front of you, there are connection cards and envelopes um, by those boxes as well. So I'm going to pray for us. Then Pastor Al is going to uh, bring up a friend of ours to, and tell you what's going on the rest of the service. And then 
Um, yeah, let's go before the Lord. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you this morning. Thank you for a great time of musical worship. Thank you for a time now where we can worship you through giving. And thank you for a time now to be able to worship you in your word. Uh, would you speak to us with your Holy Spirit? Would you help us be transformed to be able to live for you? In your name, amen. amen. Thank you, Brian. Hey, this is Pat Bresnan. And, uh, Hello, everybody. Yeah, How's look going? at that. Good to see everybody this morning. You must know a lot more people at the second service. Nobody clapped for a service. I paid. I paid. Good. Good job. Sometimes that's what you have to do. Anyway, uh, Pat, today we are coming up. Pat, we are in, uh, introducing, and the elder team is affirming Pat as one of the uh, new members of our elder team. What does that mean? Well, that means Pat's going through a process prescribed in our kind of our constitution and bylaws. And so what we do as we welcome a new team member on, it's done with a lot of prayer, forethought, interviewing, talking, connecting. Uh, we want to uh, preserve the unity of our team. We want to add to the skill that's there. And Pat's going to talk about that in a moment as he shares. And we want to uh, preserve the doctrinal purity of our team in terms of us holding up scripture and making sure we're following that. And we did that in the process as well. Our constitution and bylaws kind of dictate the fact that for a couple of weeks, we put Pat in front of you, and we do that in one way. These sheets are at the Welcome Center. If you like paper, if you like digital, you can do the QR code, go to our website and see Pat's bio there, and uh, the picture of him and Stacy, his wife. And so for right now, what we're doing is just giving an opportunity for you to get to know him and to be able to uh, find out a little bit about him. If you have further questions after he shares, please you can follow up with me by email, um, our chairman of the elder team, Andrew Wyman. Um, I will forward them on as him as well. So uh, we just want to let you know. So Pat, um, you can share a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Al. Good morning, Living Hope family. Good morning. I want to thank Al and the rest of the pastors, the elders, the staff, and you, the Living Hope Fellowship, for welcoming Stacy, uh, me, and the family three and a half years ago. There's something very special going on here at Living Hope and we're very excited to be part of it. I also want to thank my family for their love and support, and uh, some of my family members are here. Stacy, my son Ryan with his girlfriend Mel, and my sister Lee. Thank you, thank you, thank you, family. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 states, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Many of us interpret that God is communicating his love for and investment in every human life. God has a plan for us and only wants the best for us. All we must do is get to know God and let him in our lives. I grew up in Lawndale section of Northeast Philly. I have loving parents and two great older sisters. I remember how hard my parents worked to provide for us and how generous they were. My wife Stacy and I have known each other over 40 years. Ten years as friends, we got engaged and married, and we've been uh, married now for the last 28 plus years. And uh, wow, babe, 40 years. And for you men that are married, I'm still learning every single day, and I'm still trying to figure it out. We have two sons, Connor and Ryan. Ryan, I'm very proud of you, and Connor, I'm very proud of you pursuing your dreams. And of course, we have a Yerkie rescue dog, Carson. In my early professional years, my faith took a back seat Attending church only for funerals and weddings. My prayer life could be categorized as emergency situations only. Fast forward to the heart of my marriage and professional career. I realized that I was running very hard and not enjoying life. Partying with friends now became drinking in isolation. I was escaping from my responsibilities. Something deep inside of me said that I was not reaching my true potential, God's plan. In all the various roles that I play as a husband, as a son, as a father, as a brother, as a friend, as an employee. My way wasn't working. What is my purpose in life? In 2004, friends invited us to a, friend, uh, to a church in Philly. That is where I met Pastor Al and Becky and the Currys. A good friend recommended that I ask God each morning to remove the obsession to drink. He told me when I, my head hits the pillow at night, please thank him for another day sober. In March 2005, while praying with an elder, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. He presented me with a Bible and suggested that I read it every day. 
We plugged into serving teams and Bible study groups. Personal change and spiritual growth started immediately. The obsession to drink vanished. My sobriety date is February 22nd, 2005. Praise God. Thank you. I now understood my purpose in life was to serve. After serving in that Philly church for 16 years, including five as an elder, God prompted Stacy and I that it was time to leave, and we landed at Living Hope, re reuniting with some old friends. At Living Hope, I quickly plugged into Bible studying groups, men's ministry, and hospitality. I am passionate about attendee onboarding and spiritual growth. Working with the pastors, elders, and staff, I helped define and roll out new here, starting point, plan to grow, spiritual gifts, initiatives, and workshops. I also worked with the church leaders on strategy, including redefining Living Hope's mission and values. I love using my gifts at Living Hope and in the community. I'm also very active in the recovery community, helping others along their recovery journey. Today, my faith and relationship with Jesus is the top priority in my life. It starts with my extensive morning routine of Bible study, prayers, and going to the gym. When I'm done, the priorities for the day for each role I play are clearly understood. I do checkpoints with God all throughout the day and adjust accordingly. I end each day with a prayer of thanks. I am truly grateful for all the people that helped me along the way as I am still very much in process. I believe I'm paying forward others' generosity to me. I asked someone how all this God stuff works. He says, Pat, it works just fine. <laughs> For the last 30 years, as an executive at SAP, a large software company, I was able to engage with thousands of companies, including Walmart, Hobby Lobby, the MBA, Lockheed Martin, and help them with their strategy and company improvements so they can better serve their customers. These skill sets are easily applied to the church setting. From an elder perspective, I'm just in humbled and in awe how God made the, this elder appointment part of the plan and all the credit and glory go to him and the people he put in my life. I love serving at Living Hope and all the great work we do, engaging the church and the community and the world. I am passionate about God's word and putting it into action. For me, it's simple. We are in the people business, connecting people to people, people to God, and enable them to become Christ-like. I cannot wait to experience the rest of God's plan for Living Hope. Thank you, Living Hope family. Thank you. So you may know Pat. If you want to grill him more and question him, <laughs> he'll be up here. We'll, he'll wait for you. And uh, continue to pray the process. We're excited to have him join the team. And in a couple of weeks, we'll give you an update. And looking forward um, to what God can do through him and has already done through him. And so let's pray. Lord, thank you for Pat. Thanks for him and Stacy. Thank you that uh, the relationship with you is first and foremost, that they know you and they follow you, God. I pray that you continue to use them, um, bless them. Thank you that they're part of living hope and that he has had an impact on lives. Uh, thank you for his recovery story because, God, it's all about you and what you've done. And we ask you to continue to bless him and we ask your blessing on us as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks. Right. Well, this morning, uh, we continue in the Storytellers um, series, and we've been looking at just various stories in Scripture. I originally had one set for this weekend, and as I was sitting, looking through it this week and, and preparing and studying, I changed it up, and I landed in the book of Micah. Now, Micah is not going to give us a kind of narrative story, like what I mean is an instance of an occurrence or somebody overcoming something or the story of, of some miraculous event occurred. It's going to give us more of a principled picture of God's plan for us and the characteristics he wants us to kind of bear out. And every story has that. And you know, you have a story. As Pat was sharing, I, I realize that as he shares his story, and um, I'm glad he shares it a lot as, as he gets to interact with people, that God wants you to share your story, that you have a story, especially one that centers around uh, you coming to Christ and salvation. And so I encourage you to do this as we've gone through this series. That's what we've endeavored to do, to look at this and reinforce the fact that God still uses people in great ways. And there's no difference between these people that we're reading, Micah today, and your life. And God wants to use you. 
So we're going to draw out some characteristics of who Micah was. He was a prophet. His story can be found and the message that he was prophesying about in the latter part of the Old Testament. And it's a brief book, but it includes a pattern that is very similar to other prophets in, uh, the, in the Old Testament. And the story focuses in on uh, the reality that God had a message for the people of Israel, his people. He brought prophets along time to time to share this story and to be able to drive home the fact that God wanted their repentance, he wanted their heart, he loved them, and that he was a God passionately pursuing them. The book of Micah is centered around what really is the southern kingdom of Israel. The kingdom was split, and it was divided. There was a disunity. But beyond that, there was a disunity with God. And God was telling them through the the prophet Micah that he is going to bring some consequence to their life. In the Old Testament, you see God clearly communicating to people that if you do not repent, if you do not come forward and repent of your sins and accept the forgiveness that I am offering you and begin upholding the standard and living according to the standard that I have for you, then you will face consequence. Specifically, the consequence was going to be an enemy nation taking them over. This had happened period after period, and they had gone through good leadership and bad leadership. But God said that even though they were under bad leadership at times, they had no excuse. God's standard and his plan for them was the same, that they were to follow him closely and that they were to deeply uphold the principles and they were to deeply uphold the truth that he was going to share with them. Micah would share this plan. The Bible doesn't include a lot about him. But he had to be a principled person of faith who was determined to follow God. Because prophets did not have an easy plan in front of them. Their life often was marked by ridicule and rejection. Their life would be marked by a person who was isolated from the crowd because the majority of the crowd was in rebellion, in anger and bitterness against God, and the message of the prophet was, repent now, or God is going to bring more judgment. The message oftentimes did involve, like it did with Micah, a lot of hope. A hope that would say that I can save you, I want to prosper you. A hope that said you had a future. A hope that said that I will bring redemption and protection your way, but you can sacrifice all of that peace and security for your own sin. It's your choice. So Micah would offer out this plain, clear type of message to his people. I want to focus in on the latter part of the book in chapter 6. Some very familiar verses. Verses that you've probably heard before. Verses that are talked about in real clear ways of three characteristics that God asked of his people. And these probably identify for us in Micah chapter 6, particularly starting um, in verses 6 and 7. Is that they're principles of mercy, justice, and humility. Because oftentimes when we think about the sin of God's people, we think about them walking away from the very things God asked them to do in their culture. Now, you and I live in a difficult culture. It has gotten significantly more difficult for a Christian to live out biblical principles and determine to follow God. And we often choose between standing in the gap and proclaiming unapologetically the truth of God Or we begin to compromise and quiet down and begin to say, you know what, I'm just going to avoid because I want peace. The prophet wasn't asked to do that. If he was going to be a successful prophet, he was going to be heard and he was going to have to be consistent and he was probably going to have to be hated. This is not going to be a message today for me to uh, stir up your anger against the culture. You will never get me doing that. That's not my job. I am not here to stir you up and impassion you and tell you how to curse the darkness all around you. Because that's not what Jesus did. In fact, that is not what the prophet did. The prophet talked to the people of God and said, here's what God expects of you 
And here's what success looks like in faithfulness towards God. So let's just jump into verses 6 and 7 of Micah chapter 6. Now, I want you to picture a courtroom scene. And you see on the stand is God's people. And God has been giving his case over and over. It's a simple one. I redeemed you. I've saved you. I brought you out of slavery time after time. I've protected you. I've reestablished your nation. You have rebelled, and I have brought you to a place of where I was restoring you. But we get the, the response by Israel on the stand. And it's not a response of really asking wholeheartedly, what do I need to do? It's really a response that's in bitterness and almost sarcasm to say, I can't please you. Almost, I don't want to please you. They say, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? You would read that and you would say, well, aren't they asking an honest question before God? Yeah, they may be. But what we understood with the people of Israel during this time is that they become jaded and sarcastic. Maybe they looked at the experiences of their life and the circumstances and they were determined, hey, God's not doing what I thought he would do. He has not made our nation the real nation that I thought it would be. He, they're looking at the circumstances and they're determining God's not good enough. God hasn't risen up. They haven't conquered my enemies. And a little bit of what's happening in their life, or maybe a lot, is an abandonment of God's principles and the taking on of what they believe they need to do to maybe fight culture. What they need to do to make things right. See, I can be a warrior, so-called for the good, and look like I stand on God's side, and look like I am doing God's will, but not doing that at all. Satan has a way of deceiving even Christians in convincing them that they can fight a battle. And they can fight a battle against their enemies, and those enemies are really what is the focus. And Satan's way of saying, focus in on your enemy, because if you focus in on your enemy, what you can do is then you'll be on God's side. And God says, no, no, you're on my side by living out my principles. So when they ask this question, it's personal. Shall I come before the Lord, bow down? Of course, you know what worship is, Israel. You know what the Bible has said about what it means to follow God. Shall I bring burnt offerings? Of course you bring burnt offerings. Yes, do that. Will you be pleased with excessive offerings, rivers of olive oil? How about I just offer my firstborn for my transgression? Do you get a sense of almost the sarcasm? Should I just do everything for you, God, to, for the fruit of my sin that's come about in my life? They are not denying their sin. But God's response comes through Micah, and he says, He has shown you, immortal, what is good. He says, You already know. And what does the Lord require of you? I want to look at these three characteristics. I want to try to address them really, yes, in Micah's time, but it's not too different for us in our time as well. And the first thing he says is to act justly, to act justly. First of all, was Micah aware of injustice? He was. He was seeing it with Israel. He wasn't seeing injustice just being thrust upon Israel. He was seeing how they were relating with one another. He was seeing injustice among the people of Israel, that Christians... Christ followers can actually practice injustice with one another. Not a surprise, but it displeases God so much to see that. That's why Jesus spoke about it. That's why Paul wrote about it. That's why there's so much in Scripture talking about how we treat each other. Justice here really is two-pronged, and I want you to see it. Number one, it's to align yourself with the righteous standards of God. Justice is an issue of integrity. It's integrity. It's a upholding a standard that God puts in front of you that you already claim to follow. 
You stand up and you say, yes, I follow the word of God. And therefore, everything in the word of God, you will perfectly live out, right? No, we know that's not going to happen. But we understand that what I still do is say, yes, even though I'm a fallen sinner, even though I'm broken, even though I sin every day, I uphold the word of God, but I don't excuse my behavior because of my sinful state. Micah says, there is a justice that God has been talking about for centuries, Israel. Are you willing to follow this? Are you willing to uphold this? He says, put aside all the offerings that you want to bring him. Because you can bring them today on your day of worship. But tomorrow, if you go back to your injustice, you're just hypocritical. You've lost credibility. And you're not really aligned with the righteous standard of God. So it's integrity. It's saying, I believe this and I'm going to do this. It came out in their money. It came out in how they handled relationship. It came out in all kinds of stuff that God was going to ask them to do. The same stuff that you and I deal with every day. In business, in relationship, in the church, in all kinds of areas in which the opportunity to be dishonest and take advantage of another person is taken hold of, and we fail in this area. So it's an issue of integrity. But secondly, it was also an issue of restoration. It was to seek to restore what is unfair in a broken world. There was part of this that Micah understood there was injustice going on. And he expresses it in his prophecy when he says there will be a day in which God brings restoration. In chapter 4, verse 6, he says, in that day, and he's talking about the day in which God is going to make things right. It's in the future. He says this to Israel. In that day, declares the Lord, I will gather the lame. I will assemble the exiles and those I have brought to grief. I will make the lame my remnant, those driven away a strong nation. The Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from that day and forever. You know, there's going to be a day in which all justice is brought to account before God, and God is going to make everything right. And he says, Israel, there's going to be a day I'm going to restore Israel fully to what it was. I mean, Israel battles to this day. Last night, rockets coming over. They battle their, on their land. But God was very little concerned with their land in this book and the boundaries and their prominence as a nation because he's speaking to the injustice that was going on. My guess is God's declaring, I'm going to gather the lame, I'm going to assemble the exiles because Israel was mistreating the lame, the exiles, was mistreating each other. Do you know a big part of justice is the reality that what God says a Christian is to be like is that we are to be the people that say, I'm not so worried about my justice or injustice inflicted upon me. I need to be concerned with the injustice that's going on in the lives of other people. That I'm going to protect the broken, the lame, the oppressed. I'm going to take care of the foreigner. I'm going to handle the things that God wants me to handle because he says to act justly. That's not just being an honest person. That's not just, didn't cheat anybody today. That's to look upon the world and see the oppressed and see the hurting and acknowledge it and say, I want to be part of representing Jesus Christ in all of that. You know, I find myself, and, and as I talk to others, it is so easy to isolate yourself from the brokenness of this world while at the same time speaking the truth of Scripture. You know what I mean by that? There is brokenness. There are places. We live in suburban Philadelphia. I live in Philly. It's much like the neighborhoods up here. You go deeper south, you see a different scenario. I was down there yesterday. You just see poverty. You see brokenness, you see addiction, you see hurt to a level 
easy for me to stand in my neighborhood, look on it and go, man, they just get their act together. Get a job, do this, do that. It's easy for me to declare those things. God is not asking me to fix all of those things. He is not asking. He's asking the church to make sure, number one, we're not isolating ourselves from the broken, the hurting, because we are to do justice. Literally, this phrase is to do justice. And to act justly means that it's not just about building my own spirituality. It's not just about the Bible studies of living hope and the activities of living hope. It's to be part of the brokenness in the world. And it means sometimes I got to go to those places. I got to be part of that. I got to see the brokenness in food pantry clients' lives. I've got to see the brokenness in what Productive Lives does in Kensington and how they deal with those that are coming up that are so broken that look different than the people in my neighborhood. Because I still can't get away from the fact that Jesus hung out in those places. Am I, am I hanging out in those places so that I don't, so that I don't form a judgmental attitude so that I don't form an injustice in my mind that carries through. Hey, religious superiority has existed since the beginning of time, and it will always exist, and it can be subtle. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were rebuked by him. Jesus was talking to them, and in Luke chapter 11, he said this, Then the Lord said to them, You Pharisees are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside... You are filthy, full of greed and wickedness, fools. Didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? So, the, so clean the inside by giving him gifts to the poor, and you will be clean all over. What sorrow awaits you, Pharisees, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore justice and the love of God. You should tithe, yes. But do not neglect the more important things. He puts a value on some things. And the same thing that Mike is putting on it. He says there is injustice in the world. And God is a God of justice. And, and you've got to be part of this. You've got to be part of this. God may not be asking you to go down to Kensington. Or take the trip that some are taking this week to the Dominican. To go on a mission trip. But he's asking you the elements of injustice that you confront at your job or wherever you are. That you look at that and say... I'm going to not run from the broken. I'm not going to run from the oppressed. I'm not going to run from, and I'm not going to isolate myself. I'm going to be part of it because I have a responsibility to act justly in the circles that God brings and even beyond. Second thing, he wants me to love mercy. Don't just show mercy, but to love mercy, to love mercy. Now, I, I love mercy when I receive it. It's a little less of a love when I have to show it. I should say, it's a little less of a like when I have to show it. It's a natural inclination for me to be able to say, I want to be the, the one that inflicts the justice, right? Let me just tell you where you're wrong. Let me tell you what needs to be right. Let me show you the standard. God puts a counterweight here. And I want you to see something. Justice and mercy are not in balance with one another. They're not in opposition. They're not opposed in any way. But that in God, perfectly embodied grace and truth through Jesus Christ was see. He was perfect in that. So if I'm going to act justly, God says, Israel, I want you to love mercy too. Now, mercy was this. And it was primarily in the relational part of what they were dealing with. I covered mercy a couple weeks ago in the story of David and Saul, and what happened in that is that Saul was pursuing him for four years, wanted to kill him. David had a chance to kill him. He cuts his robe instead of that. David automatically says, you know what, I've committed a sin before God, which indicates his heart. And he says, you know what, I, I, you are the king's anointed. I should have mercy on you. David had mercy on him. Saul comes to this repentant place at the end of that kind of chapter in, in 1 Samuel 24. And he says, 
He says, you are a bigger man. God has shown me today. And he wells up and he sees and you think it looks genuine. And then literally in 1 Samuel 26, short time later, he sends 3,000 men out to kill David again. And it gives you an indication of, of just what happens in the human heart. That one moment I can be this justice warrior, going to eliminate my enemies, and the next moment I can show mercy, and then the following moment I can be the justice warrior to eliminate my enemies. He says, wait a minute, if you're going to love mercy, you it's a consistent practice in your life. The way I've kind of defined it as I was reading this week, week was true mercy will have an element of sacrifice to it. It's my intentional response after I've been treated poorly. It's my intentional response to reflect the heart of God, to accept the imbalance and the tension that the Christian lives in in this world. That while I have a standard of truth, I uphold, and I say, I know this is the truth that the world needs. And I know Jesus Christ is the one the world needs. And I can have confidence, and I can go through life that way. But guys, you know what happens? When we poorly represent the justice and poorly represent the mercy of God, we become warriors for all kinds of issues, and we see the little battles instead of seeing the full war. Now, you guys, if you, unless you were trapped under something heavy for the last couple of weeks, you probably saw that people raged against what was a Last Supper kind of picture or in the opening elements of the Olympics, and people got angry. Yeah, I, I, I got angry when I saw it. Right? I got, oh, the representatives, oh my goodness, how could they do this? Mocking us in intentional attack. And then I stepped back. I was like, all right, instead of reading this post and that post, Instead of doing this, like, wait a minute. What did Jesus say was going to happen? He said I was going to be hated. He said that I was going to be attacked. He said that he was going to be hated. He was going to be attacked. No surprise. Not surprised. So what am I supposed to do? Do I sit back and say, it's all okay. It's okay. They can do what they want. Anybody can do what they want. God wants me to handle those situations very wisely. I mishandle a lot of them. I do. I'm going to go right to justice. I want to point out, this is why you're going to hell. This is what I think of you. This is who I am. I think that's what the Pharisees were doing a little bit. I think the response and all that is, I learned as I processed it, I want to defend Jesus. I love Jesus. The focus is Jesus, not the sinner. The focus is the mercy of Jesus, to see what Jesus would do with that person. That as he hung on a cross, he looked at them and he said, Jesus, Lord, forgive them, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I have no idea the motives of an Olympic organizer. I have no idea, guys. I can't figure that out. I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to spend gobs of time trying to uncover it so that I can stoke more anger. But what I am going to do, I'm going to avoid celebrating those things, and I'm going to avoid celebrating the anger of fueling people up. I'm going to avoid all of that. And what I'm going to do is say, Jesus, I'll defend your honor, and I'm going to make you center part of that. But I don't want to become a reactionary culture. Because there are so many opportunities I'm missing on a daily basis to show the mercy of God. And I want to focus in on those things. God says that mercy is motivated from the fact that when he saw me as, as an enemy, apart from Christ, he sent Jesus to reconcile me to himself. That when he looked at me, he said, Al, you're helpless, you're hurting you are hopeless, and you can't do anything for your salvation. I'm not going to throw more anger on you because, you know what? Mercy can't do. Mercy can do what judgment can't. Mercy can do so much more than judgment. Because it was because of his mercy that I had the opportunity 
to trust him as my savior. It's because of his mercy that I could see my sin and know I wasn't condemned for it. It's because of his mercy that I can worship him and treat him as the God that he is and my savior. And he says, when you receive that and you become that instrument of mercy, he says, you understand mercy. He says, what you can do is now generously distribute it. Given, it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It will be poured out, poured into your lap. For with this measure you use, it will be measured to you. You know what he says? In a topic, and he talks about mercy. He says, the more mercy you give, the more mercy I will give. This is a big topic. And we have to be people of mercy. It doesn't mean you're weak. And I think that leads into the next characteristic, the last one, to walk humbly with your God. He says, Israel, you want to give offerings? Go ahead and try. He says, give, give, your, give your offerings. And by the way, Micah is, is very passionate about this. You go back to chapter 1, it says he's crying and he's wailing about all of this. He's just absolutely broken over all of this because he wants the same thing to happen in his life. But he says, God wants you to act justly. God wants you to love mercy. And he wants you to walk humbly. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, Jesus said. Meek or not weak. Humility is not weakness. We have a struggle with the idea of being a merciful, loving, grace-oriented person and being weak. We have a hard time with that, don't we? Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. It falls in line with Jesus' teaching that says that I am going to do this in the culture. I'm going to use you. But I want you to talk about what it means to walk humbly. Number one, to walk is a consistent and faithful progress in the right direction. To walk with God is a consistent and faithful progress in the right direction. Did it require the obedience of Israel? Yes. God says, I want you to travel through life with me, abide in me, be in me, stick with me, hang with me. He says, I want you to lean on me. I want you to know it's because of me. And that when you start walking in your own direction, humility is never, ever possible, guys. You can't do it. In the Garden of Eden, when pride welled up into Adam and Eve, they did what God didn't want them to do, even though he had given them everything. That's the potential of our wickedness, is to be able to say, I can walk away from God even when he's provided everything. But God says to walk humbly is consistent, faithful progress in the right direction. And secondly, to walk humbly is in a relationship of dependence upon God. It says, Al, you're just a sinner saved by grace. Al, you're broken. Al, you may have this position. You may have that position. You may do this. You may have a legacy and a great family that you were raised in. And they were leaders in the church. And you're a leader in the church. Doesn't matter. Because we all stand before God and we all stand before him broken people and he uses us. And the more he can use us is based upon the humility that I am willing to work on in my life. When I was teaching on this years ago, I had a little picture in my slides. This probably goes back a long time. I kind of modified it. And I looked at this. At the point of the cross, love, mercy, justice, and grace are thrown into my life in a perfect way by God. And if I let them become the river that just flows into my life, and I let them be the thing that's controlling, then humility will happen. I don't have to work on being humble. But you owning mercy means you say, Lord, I don't deserve anything I have, and I shouldn't be asking for anything. I should be asking you what I can give you. I call it the flow of my life. I'm going to flow in this way. And that there's a flow that the Holy Spirit produces. And people that are strong in this culture, that repent before God, that stand up and have an impact, are people that live out justice, mercy, and grace the way God has described it in Scripture. Israel was living in anger, pride, and bitterness. And it was masked in self-righteous adherence to tithes, offerings, 
worship, and church. But on the inside, God saw what was going on. What's going on in the inside for you? Humility is powerful, guys. Spurgeon said, when you have found out what you really are, you will be humble. For you are nothing to boast of. To be humble will make you safe. To be humble will make you happy. To be humble will make music in your heart when you go to bed. To be humble here will make you wake up in the likeness of your master by and by. Is it the humility in and of itself? It's humility that receives the correction of God and receives the direction of God where my life can be put back on track. Jesus gave the perfect example of it. He said, and as Paul wrote, he himself, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death and even death on a cross. The worship team's going to come up and close in a last song about revival. And this morning, what I want you to do is ask if there needs to be a revival in your own heart. First of all, what I want you to know is that if, if you've come today and you say, I, I don't know Jesus, I don't know what it means, I don't know if today was my last day, what would happen? And I want you to know, you can know that today. You can be reassured because of this servant, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came and he humbled himself to a death on a cross that your sins can be forgiven. And you can receive forgiveness today. You can receive salvation. You can know that. We're going to be up here for prayer today. Come on up. We'd love to pray with you and talk to you about Jesus becoming your Savior because he already is. He wants to know you more. He wants you to know him. But today, if you're an angry cultural warrior trying to fix the world through every other thing and just welling up in anger, God, God says today, I want you to know you can have an impact through the mercy the justice of God, yes, but through humility. And he can change the world through you. And he can change people around you. And he can use you in a greater way. He can use you in your mercy the way he could never in your judgment. Lord, thank you for changing our hearts. We are people that will continue to stray our way even in subtle ways. Lord, we, we, we struggle in so many ways. And God, I struggle in all of this. But the reminder from Micah tells me, Lord, that the same thing you prescribed for Israel thousands of years ago, you prescribed for me today, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we close? If you are in need of prayer, we have folks up at the front. Peace like a river wash over me. Immerse me in water as deep as the sea. Hide me in love, your healing embrace. Peace like a river. Wash over me and as I worship your majesty, worship your holy name, Jesus, my everything. All that I am is
Lord, for we have been shown mercy to compel us to give it, that those, Lord, that we so easily want to despise, such were we. Father, we stand on truth, and we will not waver, but may we present who you are to the world. 
a world that hung you on the cross, Lord Jesus, and you did. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Lord, will we 